We will be referencing different scripture verses, so if you have your Bible there. But the subject is, the subject is, as your outline says, the family of God. Um, and uh, what we want to do first, obviously, is define it. Do, do you want to grab a, you can grab an outline there on the front pew there, please, thank you. What, what is it? Okay, so if you have your outline again, and you look at point A, it is uh, not universal fatherhood in the sense that, well, as a scripture, we, some would say that, well, it's just that everybody is God's child and ultimately he will re redeem everyone and save everyone. We don't, we're not going that route because the scripture doesn't go that route. You know, that sounds good, though, when you think about it, to, to, the, to the human ear and to at least my own disposition. I said, oh, that'd be great, but that's not the truth. So we want to be careful about that. And the scripture does present the universal fatherhood of God in some sense. And I, I want to emphasize this in the creative sense, in that we are all offspring of his in, in the sense of creation from him. Uh, that's the way I want to classify that term, offspring. And Paul, in his uh, sermon on at Athens in chapter 17 of Acts, verse 26, he says this, And he made from one every nation of mankind to live on all faces of the earth, having determined their boundaries, appointed time and boundaries of their habitation. So, <clears throat> as evangelicals, we, we quickly concede, yes, in some sense, we are all of the family of God, From the, uh, to reiter reiterate again, that we are created. We are created. But let me, let me just be very firm in saying that we don't use that term to say that everybody is redeemed. Everybody is in the family of God in the way that we're going to look at it. And that is point B, the specific sense. Critical to our systematic theology is the, this concept of position, okay? particularly as we see it in the New Testament, in the light versus in the darkness, dead versus alive. That's, they're very much part of Paul's theology. And again, it, it behooves us to, to, to grab onto that. Not only that, but the, the, the theological tension of the already but not yet. We, we live in the already but not yet. We are already justified but not yet glorified, okay? So when you run into fellow believers that say, well, you know, you, you, it is possible for you to not sin. I said, well, <laughs> let me just throw this tension at you, the already but not yet. Though, though in the glorified state there's no sin, but yet in the temporal state that I'm in, yes, I will sin. And that's the reality of it. Uh, and John says that he that says he's without sin is lied and the truth is not in him. So that, that's that concept of the already and the not yet. And, and that's the tension that we are waiting for the day of our redemption to draw nigh. So when I, uh, back to your outline, point B there. When I look at this and say, we're talking about the specific <clears throat> fatherhood of God and that we are in the, the family of God. And in 1 Corinthians 12, and you can turn there because we're, we're going to park there in a couple seconds. Um, verse 13, for what, by one spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jew or Greek, whether slave or free. And we were all made to drink of one spirit. So this, this is making reference to at, at, at our conversion. And you, you, you can debate the timing, but I say at our regeneration. Because when you look at conversion, you've you got to look at it organically, don't you? While, while regeneration is the, is the actual time of our conversion, we, we know from scenario uh, looking back, we see uh, foreknowledge, election, predestination, uh, calling, conversion is the drawing, and then regeneration, and then in that circle of regeneration is repentance, faith. So it all that aspect of it is organic, that it all happens together, but it's then that we are placed in, as the text I read, we are placed into one body. That's the baptism of the Spirit. And my Pentecostal friends would debate that, and I said, well, that's fine, but you, whatever, I'm believing and using it to, to, to emphasize what I'm saying. This is, this is when I'm now no longer in the family of darkness. 
in the, in the family of death, in the family that I inherited from Adam, and it is a reality, uh, I'm in the family of God. So th this is the direction that we're going to take. This is what uh, the specific family of God that we're in. So there is a term that describes this, and again, I'm, I'm not going to get too involved in this because I'm, I'm more interested in the obligations of family life, all right? And that's going to be a bit of a heated topic, but we're going to run with that. But the, the, the very concept of our adoption, you see it stated very clearly in Ephesians 1, 5, and we know that. And then when you go over into uh, Romans 8 in the section where Paul talks about the spirit, uh, the, the life in the spirit, he talks about us you know, adopted and the, and the consequences of that is our relationship to God is of a father. But this text here, Ephesians 1, 5, and you've been through this as a church quite thoroughly, so I'm not going to belabor it. But when he says he predestined us to adoptions as sons through Jesus Christ to himself, according to the kind intention of his will, that, that's part of our election in the sense that God said, I'm not only going to, I've not only choose you, I've not only chose you and I've not only uh, decided to redeem you, reconcile you, and the list just goes on of what he's done, but I'm, I'm going to adopt you into my family. And there's the human aspects of adoption, which we're somewhat familiar with, but the divine aspects are, are, are much more, let's just say, particular. Uh, John MacArthur's commentary, he, he emphasizes the idea of our adoption in defining it, the riches we have in Christ, the blessings, see, and let, let, we, we possess all the spiritual blessings now, but we also uh, possess a finan or tangible blessings, right, in the, in the end. Even now we do, but in the end, <laughs> we get it all, don't we? We, we get the kingdom that's ours. New heavens and new earth wherein dwells righteousness. But he also emphasizes the new nature as Peter de describes it. Uh, and there's, there's more to this. William Hendrickson in his commentary emphasizes the concept of adoption, the new name, right? What is, what is my name, a son of God? What's your name, a son of God? Uh, versus a son of what? Wrath or of darkness. He emphasizes our new legal standing, which is quite critical because, again, we, we inherit the riches of Christ, don't we? And we have it now, but the, the future aspect of that, as I just mentioned, is <laughs> we get it all. So these, these ideas are not just theological abstractions, but they, they affect the way we live. They, they affect our checkbook. And we're going to get to that. Let me just run that one at you. They affect our checkbook. Uh, new family relationships with children of God. Uh, Wayne Grudem in his excellent theology emphasizes the fatherhood of God, the leading of the spirit. So these are all aspects of the, the adoption. Okay. And when, when people say, just by side note, you know, oh, I, I want to understand deeper the love of God. Um, for some, that's emotive, okay? But uh, in my opinion, it, it has to be theological first in the sense that we grasp all these things, and then it can be emotive after that if that's the type of person you are. I don't necessarily go that way, but it's, it's hard not to grasp the love of God when you start looking at this and say, wait a second, if, if he wouldn't have done what he did and put me in his family and given me all the blessings that I have, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, then I, I will continue the way of all flesh, all right? And that's ultimately destruction, isn't it? So that, that's the, the tact we're going to take, the, the specific family of God as those who are his children purchased by the blood of Christ. So that brings us to point two on your outline now, obligations of family life, all right? <laughs> Um, and let me just say this. We should like each other as Christians, right? With a Philadelphia-type love. But we don't always do it, right? But we're absolutely commanded to love each other, all right? There's, that's a non-negotiable. So... 
Sometimes we don't like each other the way we should, but there's, there's no question that we are to love the brethren. That's, that's a sign of regeneration. So <laughs> that, kind of, that kind of puts us in an uneasy spot because sometimes we may not like other believers and that gives us an excuse not to conduct our family obligations toward them, all right? So I'm first to say, let's get that off the chart and say, well, like it or not, I got to love them. So the, the challenge to this, and I have that on your outline there, point A, is our individualism in the family of God. Now, and I say this because of where we live, the culture of the United States of America, with its so many great blessings, richest country of all time, so blessed in so many ways, and I challenge those who want to leave the country and, and are constantly denigrating it to say, just, just take a minute and see how blessed you are. Maybe that'll open your eyes. I hope so. Uh, having lived in Africa, I know, and some of you have been there, and you can say, yes, that's quite true, how blessed we've been physically. But the materialism of our culture can, can be a challenge to us in performing our, our family duties in the family of God. And what, and what I mean by this, our possessions, our things, our toys uh, can, can hinder us from being maybe as liberal as we should in giving financial resources to others in the family or even to the church. Uh, it, it can blind us, it can blind us into this, again, clear distinctive of a positional change. And I say this gently that those of us who do funerals, Jonathan and I do, uh, I'm not aware of anyone else who's a minister here, it could be wrong, but you, you, you boy, do you ever see that when it's time to do a funeral? Uh, you, obviously you grasp that when, you have, when one of your loved ones or friends passes, but, but as the minister you're saying, Ooh, <laughs> there's been a change here. There's been a relocation physically, and now there's a relocation spiritually. This is a very sober reality that the minister is confronted with. And it's humbling, and it should intensify our zeal to preach the gospel. So that's, that's where we as Christians in the family of God, we've we got to get these positional truths in our thinking and say, okay, yeah, I have an obligation to the family of God all these wonderful possessions that are because of living in the United States of America and it's because of the Puritan Christian work ethic. That's another subject. Um, I, I, I want to be careful that I don't let my things and toys take my resources and my time and my energy to deviate it away from obligations in the family of God. <laughs> you know, when I talk to people sometimes about, well, I don't go to church anymore as a Christian. You know, they're believers, and they say, well, I, uh, church ain't my thing. I said, really? I said, who are you going to spend eternity with? The church. So it better be your thing, and real quick. Because if it doesn't, I'm going to look into your soul and say, are you even a believer? And again, that that's trite statement I, I made in the beginning is quite true that we may not like everybody but we got to love everybody we, we may not even like certain churches or the way they do things but we, we begin to participate and I find this that those perhaps that I don't have an affinity and natural likeness to um, humanly speaking and I'm around them and I just love them and guess what I start liking them see so this is extremely critical these, these delusions that we can fall away Here's another one that keeps us away uh, is the success syndrome. You know, so very successful people, face it, in the churches that you, you float in, there's a lot of successful people. But, but you go into some of the other churches in the cities, especially where I work sometimes, there's believers there, but humanly speaking, they haven't been too successful for a variety of reasons. Lots of times it's just bad choices. Or it may be what they've inherited from their family and just haven't done the best so sometimes it's difficult for us as believers to uh, perform our obligations in the body because we point to them and says hey that's your fault 
you know, you, you, you never should have started that habit. Or, hey, you didn't listen. We gave you financial counseling and you just didn't listen. There's a balance there, but we really got to be careful that we look around and say, yeah, we're, we're all fallible. We make mistakes. So <clears throat> I'm not going to have that attitude that I'm, I'm not going to reach out to you or help you or work with you because you made bad choices. If anything, if anything, we should say, no, no, we're, <laughs> we're, we're a hospital. Uh, we're, we're, we're not. And oh, someone was telling me that yesterday. Ah, I forget who it was, was interviewing someone. Uh, and the interviewer was saying, well, Christianity is a crutch. And the person that, the, the pagan that was interviewing this guy, and the guy said, no, it's not a crutch, it's a hospital. And he's right. He's right, it's a hospital. Or, or This is what we depend on, and that's the way it should be. So the last thing that can inhibit us to our family obligations is this compartmentalism, all right? That says, well, this is church, this is where I do, I come there, and I participate in it, and then the consequent result of that is then I go do my thing. Yeah, that's true. I, you know, I have my job, and maybe I even evangelize on my job. I try to make good decisions, you know. I try to raise my kids in the church. But there's still that temptation to compartmentalize it. Versus saying, no, it's our life. You know, blood is thicker than water, right? The blood of Jesus Christ. Because we, we, if you come from an ethnic family like I do, we wouldn't so much say that, but that would kind of be the guys, oh, blood is thicker than water. We take care of our own, our family. And that's true. But let's take it a step further and say blood is thicker than water, the blood of Jesus Christ. That's who bought us. That's, we, we all have our families, but let me just encourage you in the right balance <laughs> that this is the family that lasts. Now, when I was converted, there was not a lot of tension in my family. There's a little bit of mystery, but other than that, but others pay a very dear price, and particularly like in the Middle Eastern countries and some of those other countries, they, they lose it all. When they're converted, they lose it all. How much more does that intensify the obligation of the overall family of God? So now that I've thrown this one at you, kind of challenges that may... Uh, it, uh, again, hinder you from doing what we're going to look at our obligations. Let's look at them. Use of gifts in the family is absolutely essential. All right, that's that's. And you should be at First Corinthians twelve now. Uh, we all have spiritual gifts. If I might do this in the question and answer period, I might ask you what your gift or gifts are. We all have them. But uh, let's just survey this section. You should be in 1 Corinthians 12. And if you have your outline then, then uh, 1 to 3, uh, 12, 1 to 3, and I call this our badge or our confession of faith. This is our, this is our standard in the family of God. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware. You know that when you were pagans, you were led astray to the dumb idols, however you were led. Therefore... I make known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit of God says Jesus is his curse, and no one can say that Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. So that's our flag. We raise it, and we say the family of God, this is, this is our ensign. Jesus is Lord. Christ is our King. That's, that's on our flag. That right there, there it is, our cross. He, he is our King. All right. In the old days, flags meant a lot. We, we've seen our flag just destroyed, but if you're any kind of uh, historian and you study any kind of military history, you, you realize that many, time, many lives were lost when the flag went down and men picked it up. Particularly in the Civil War and confrontal assaults like that, it was, it was sacred. Not just their flag, but the battle flag of their particular group whether it was their division or not. So that says a lot for identity, doesn't it? And this, this is our identity. Jesus Christ is Lord. He's king. He's boss. And I'm glad because he's a better boss than the boss of darkness. 
Let me just say that, and you all know that, and some who may have come from a more degraded lifestyle, which is my case, you shake your head and say, yes, he's a lot better master than the other one. So that, that's our end. Send back to your outline there. And verse 4 and 5, now there are varieties of gifts, but same spirit, there are varieties of ministries, and the same Lord. Okay, so we all have different gifts. And these gifts are operative. Notice what he says. I'm using the New American Standard here. There are a variety of ministries, which is where these gifts operate through. Okay, which ministry comes from a servant, right? That's what, that's what comes to the same root. Now, it doesn't necessarily have to be officially in the church, but in the whole body, this is where the gifts come. They, they're operative through ministry, through serving, right? So we've got that cleared up. <clears throat> but verse 6, and there are varieties of effects, but the same God who works all things in all persons, all right? So as we use our gifts to serve the body, uh, God blesses them in one way or another, right? Uh, but also what's very critical in the family of God in using our gifts is that some people's gifts are blessed much more than others. Okay, some, some of us work in very humble situations. That's always been my experience. I, I've never worked in a real, let's just say, prolific ministry with a large church or large school or anything. It's always been in a small group, and that's great because that's where God put me. That's what I'm designed for, all right? So that, that should take the tension out of jealousy, right, to someone else who has great potential and will blossom in God's providence. So, we, we, again, we have to get a hold of this, that it's God that gives these gifts. It's God that opens these up. So there should be no room for jealousy in the kingdom of God or tension there. Now, this is the one that I really want to park on. Just for a minute, if you have your outline again, uh, verse uh, 7 there. But to each one is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. So this is a family obligation that you have, that I have, that one or more of the spiritual gifts that we have, we are under obligation for the common good to serve the family through these gifts. That's the family of God. End of sentence. All right. Now, for those who say, well, I don't want anything to do with the church. Just leave me alone. I'm an island. You, you will shrink. That's, that's what happens. When, when I talk to people who seem to be bored with their Christian experience, that's one of the first things I ask them. Are you going to church? Well, no. Are you using your gift? No. I say, well, that's, that's part of the problem. Because you're, you're geared, when you're redeemed, you're geared with these gifts to serve the kingdom. And, and act, activity is what gives intensification to the faith. See? That, that's what, humanly speaking, makes it exciting, if you want to say it that way. I found it quite exciting to go to Africa with three little kids. I mean, they were little, too. Junior was probably, he was born in October and we left in December, so I don't know what the math is there. Well, he's probably eight weeks old, I guess. Yeah, eight weeks. I don't even know he's that old. But the, the movement of God was pretty exciting. It was very interesting uh, to see along the way people that God raised up to help with these three little kids on the 24-hour flight, all right? And it was exciting. So my, my point is, if, if you don't get this, and I think most of you do here, that God has given uh, uh, each one gifts for the, for the common good, and that, that we got to use them. And if we don't, we will, we will dry up. And then also, uh, our family, the family of God will suffer. Okay? So if I have the gift of giving, and I've made a lot of money, which I don't have, I didn't know I made a lot of money. I do have the gift of giving. I know that. I have the gift of helps and giving. So what? It didn't come from me. I'm selfish by nature. I admit that, but God has given me that gift, so I'm always looking for opportunities to use it. But say I have it, uh, and, and I was made a lot of money, and I just held on to it. You, I would dry up spiritually. Other people see that. The family suffers for it. Missing suffers for it. Everybody suffers. In one way or another, they suffer for it. So, <laughs> 
don't, don't think that you can get away with this, okay? And you encourage others in this. They say, you're the one that's going to lose out. The one who says, I'm not going to use my gifts for the family of God. But it also uh, begins to shrink your identity as a believer. Because this, this is our identity. As a Christian, the, one of the main ways to express our identity is use these wonderful gifts that, that God has given to us. You know, why, why does Jonathan teach and preach? Because that's who he is. He's a believer, but he's gifted in a great way, and that, and that, is, that is his identity. Obviously, yes, our identity is in Christ, but when you begin to use your gifts, it, it, co it comes out. Now, I've always been bivocational and, and done c c concrete work. I love it. I, I just admit that. And I paid for it. That's why I limp. But it's me. That's, that's who I am. And, and when I see a concrete truck or any kind of forming or anything, or I do it, I still do it, it the, the, my eyes light up. The eyes of battle light up. But that's the way it should be for us as Christians. That when we have a gift, gifts, and we have opportunity to use it to serve the family, the eyes of battle should light up. That we should say, hey, this is... And sometimes it's difficult to get to the point of the opportunity where we know we should do it. There's a lot of satanic opposition, but if you, if you have the gift of uh, teaching, and you say, okay, I'm working for CEF, <laughs> it's a struggle mentally, but, but when you get out on the field of battle out it goes and there's a there's a spiritual ex experience that y you will sense and I, I think that you'll all get that so that's a primary <laughs> let's just say one of the primary obligations of being in the family of God is use of our gifts for the common good and you've studied this there's a listing in Corinthians there in that same chapter but even Paul over in Romans when he talks about in the context and you can turn there if you like, uh, Romans uh, 12, uh, that whole section 3 through 8, is an explanation of service, gifts, power God has given us. But I find it interesting, it, it's, a, it's, it's an explanation of, I beseech you therefore God, by the mercies of God, you present your body as a living sacrifice, holy, except the one to God, which is your reasonable service. What is your reasonable service? Well, he lays it out for us right here. Uh, we're members of one another, and our reasonable service is not just the idea of sanctification, but it's it's serving each other. Okay. And and when you think about it, you look at a guy like George Mueller, and he, <laughs> what a testimony! And he he obviously had the gift of giving and helps, and and again, as you study these gifts, you you realize they're fluid in defining them to a point. But there's no question, verse 8, or he who exhorts in his exhortation, he who gives with liberality. And he certainly gave to those orphans, and God worked in, in just amazing ways. Or he who leads with diligence. So, point one, okay? You, you understand the, the, the severe, let's just say, delineation I've made about we are are in the particular blessed family of God. And we have to be careful about those things that would inhibit us as we talked about them, materialism, success syndrome, separate compartments, and say, first, we must use our gifts to serve each other. Okay? And in the using of our gifts, uh, we will not shrink, but we will grow. And, and the, the spiritual maturity in us will produce an intensification of delight in our spiritual experience. Despite your emotive makeup. You know, some people are real naturally bubbly, and that's great. Other people, like myself, aren't so much that way. But when I'm using my gifts, it's delightful. So that's obligation one. Back to your outline. Uh, ob obligation two in using our gifts, if you have your Bible there, now go to Hebrews 10.25. And, and just remember, the structure of Hebrews is, is laid out in such that there's four warnings in it. There's the theology of Jesus Christ above all, right, right through the section. But uh, the author is very careful that when, when he discusses that, that he, he emphasizes that just be careful you don't walk away from this or apostatize. 
And the exhortation that we read in Hebrews uh, 10.25 is in that context. Not forsaking our assembling together as the habit of summons, but encouraging one another and, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Uh, this is another one of our obligations in the family of God is that we encourage each other, okay? We, we come alongside and we try to get in each other's skin in the sense that we see what they're doing or what they're experiencing and try to encourage them. So um, everybody can't encourage everybody in everything because all our experiences aren't necessarily the same. But, but as you begin to rub shoulders with other believers, you, you can sense, you know what, there, there's someone that uh, I've walked the path that that person has walked. Okay? And when, when in your mind it says something, whether it's the evil one or just your own natural inclination, says, yeah, but I, I don't want to breach their privacy or their confidence. Throw that out the window and say, no, I'm going to pray and I'm going to do it. I'm going to step into their life and come alongside of them. I, I, I can't really remember anyone that I've actively tried to come alongside and encourage that pushed me away. O others would take it for a while and then that was it. But this, this is very, very critical in our experience, especially the times that we live in, that we, we are aggressively encouraging one another in the faith, to hold on to the faith, but, but encouraging them in whatever particular issue they're struggling in. Again, like I said in the beginning, we may not like everybody, but we've got to love everybody. And you may find that someone that you don't particularly have an inclination to have that Philadelphia-like love to, you might just die to self and say, all right, Lord, I'm, going, I'm, going, I'm just going to do it. Charge. Charge. And you may find that that person, you begin to encourage them and call them and meet with them. Um, and it turns out to be a, a very tight friendship. So, so don't, let that, don't let those barriers, especially uh, you more mature ladies, don't let that barrier hold you back that says, well, I, I, I'm on in years and she's a professional woman or she has it all together. No. Don't, don't subject yourself to those barriers and say, I... I'm not going to do this because I'm afraid. Step out, and maybe maybe the person will say, "No, thank you. I appreciate your love, but I don't." Or or with young families, you you older men that have successfully raised your families in one ways, you know, don't be afraid to step into a young man's life and say, "Hey, I, I want to encourage you in this. I want to help you in this. I, I see maybe." You're not managing your finances the way that you should. Let, let me just encourage you in this. Uh, I, I try to do this um, in ministries, step, stepping alongside guys that in many cases are much more talented and have a lot more on deck than I do. But I don't let that stop me because I'm saying, wait a second, I, I see an area where I can encourage these guys and, and, and strengthen their faith. I, I may fall out of the picture eventually, that's fine, but there's going to be somebody else. So this is what discipleship is. It's part of discipleship, all right? That's another area. We're not going to get into that tonight. But it's, it's just stepping out. So you have obligation to use your gifts. You, you have obligation to, have felt, to actively have fellowship with others for the purpose of encouraging, all right? And, and if you take that route, it helps the gossip, too. Because I have a tendency... To gossip less, and just and that's a sinful behavior that all of us do to one point or another, or be overcritical when I say, you know, how can I encourage this person? How can I lift them up? How can I encourage this ministry? How can I encourage this church? See, doesn't mean that we don't look at the warts, but it does. It takes it takes an advantage change. Um, the other one is uh, point D, giving, uh, and how how critical that is in the church. And uh, we were at Jonathan's church last week, and the ministry that was there serves in India, and they're just on fire. Okay, they're on fire. <laughs> so, so you can't help but see that ministry and say, "Wait a second, I don't need some of these toys. Let's just get rid of them." 
okay, let's get rid of some of these toys, meaning us adults in particular, and, and invested in some of these ministries. But it's much deeper than that. It's, it's even seeing the body life in the church. The, those of us who may have some more, it's not just giving internationally, but even in the local church to say, wait a second, this, this family's really struggling. You know, I, I see their car pulling into the parking lot and they got four bald tires on there. And I'm saying, well, wait a second, you know, let's, let's talk about this. Let, let's get this straightened out. And this is, this is where you've got to be careful. Oh, no, it's their own fault. They spent the money on a big screen TV. They should have bought tires. Okay, well, so what? Next time around, maybe buy tires. But Paul gives a promise here in 9.6 of 2 Corinthians. Now, this I say, he who sows sparingly shall also reap sparingly. He who sows bountifully shall also reap bountifully. Let each one do just as his purpose in his heart, not grudging or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. There, there's that tension when we get this when we, when we empty this hand when we get it when we empty this hand guess what happens God fills it again when, when we empty this hand and we catch this and we give not just financially that, that's the context here but we, we give to others in the church who need help um, ministries worldwide God fills us back up now, we, now, and this is what I was explaining to these guys last week in this ministry. I said the infrastructure of the United States, we, we have a lot to work from and we can give generously. Other countries, they don't have that infrastructure, but it doesn't exempt them from giving. I found that to be the case in serving in the African context, that they were hesitant to give because they were so poor. And I was a Western missionary, and we had a lot, and we tried to give and serve. I said, no, no, that doesn't exempt you. <laughs> you, you. You can give a couple hands of bananas and put them on the altar at the church, and somebody else who needs it will take it. See? But once you get that principle, you start to release what you have and just give in the, in the, um, in the family of God. It can be very, let me just say, it can be very exciting. And I, I have experienced that. I'm not always the best at it, but when I am obedient and I experience it, it makes my hair stand on end to see what God does. But there's a, there's a, a challenge to this over in First John. But whoever has the world's goods and beholds his brother in need, closes his heart against him, how does, he love, how does the love of God abide in him? All right. And again, there, there's a balance there. I, I've worked in, in ministries where we've actually said, okay, you're done. We've helped you. We've given you. You're going to have to run with this. You, you're going to have to learn some lessons here. And, and there's a tension there. But that's another way, that's another obligation in the family of God. So I've touched the obligation of using your gifts. I've touched the obligation of fellowship. And I've touched the obligation of giving. <laughs> Let's, let's finish with the hard one now. Right? Um, uh, har harmony, harmony in the family life. How to create unity. All right? So uh, I'm talking about our immediate physical family. Particularly if there's believers in it. Your, your church family. Your ministry family. Ministries you're involved in or you help or you participate in. Um, how, how do you create unity in this? Especially, let me just say, I, I see this more and more. There's a lot of division uh, in churches and even particularly ministries, power church ministries. Um, and I'm beginning to, to see that, that it's, it's not just endemic, but it's, it's part of the times that we live in because there is orchestrated confusion in our country coming from the culture by design and it's spilling over into the church and um, I, I get concerned especially in, in some of the ministries I mean there's 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 so much friction there's always friction all right but there's, there's a fair amount of friction <laughs> and I, as I've been thinking about this, I want to ask you a question, and I'm going to ask myself a question. In your, in your personal devotions today, what sin did you confess? Maybe you didn't, maybe you didn't, okay? But let's just say over the last week, what, what sin did you confess? 
Um, and I want to particularly challenge those of us who are in leadership to this. So wait a second. Are we practicing this? It's, that's, that's, one of, that's probably, in my opinion, the key discipline in maintaining good relationships. If we confess our sin is faithful and just, forgive us our sin, cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And we, look, we don't look at confession the way that some traditions do. We, we are already forgiven. We are already justified. But we look at confession as a practical, right? Confess, say this, homologato, say the same thing about. So if I'm saying the same thing about maybe areas of my life that aren't too good in relation to my marital relationship, then, then it's, it's forgiven. But God is saying, hey, look, look at yourself. Look at yourself. See, and boy, James hits this right on. Uh, for if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man who looks at his natural face in the mirror, and for once he has looked at himself and gone away, he has immediately forgotten what kind of person he is. So I'm suggesting to you that one of the key ways in the family of God to promote harmony is that we are, um, we are uh, uh, aggressively practicing this discipline of confessing our own sin and examining ourselves in a good way and, and saying, hey, I'm a, I'm a man who looks in the mirror. So when we enter, whether it's family relationships or even in the church, we have multi-church staff, maybe there's tension, guys say, hey, let, let's, let's take some time and let's look at ourselves. And let God point things out to us. and let, let's, let's lay it on the line. Let's be humble. Let's, let's not, oh, you did this. Not, not, I don't want to hear that. Let's let's go to square one and look at myself first, and then we'll we'll look at some of the tension areas. Uh, how critical that is. Um, yeah, uh, if you don't take anything away from this, to take that away, especially if you participate in other ministries and you see tension there. Uh, there's another thing that develops the harmony. Another focus. Um, and that's the outward focus of, of Matthew 28, 18 to 20. And we, we know that's the Great Commission. So look, look, for example, at the political scenario that we live in today in this country and realize those who oppose what we believe, they, they make up so many different varieties of groups, don't they? But yet they have one goal, don't they? to implement their agenda. So they actually work together on that, even though, <laughs> humanly speaking, whew, when I see some of these coalitions, I said, how on earth do you guys tolerate each other? But it's because they have a common goal. How, how much more should the church, the family of God, have, have harmony and unity because we have a common goal, don't we? We have evangelism, building the church. How many axes should we bury and just say, look, I don't care who gets the credit. I'm going to teach this children's class, or I'm, I'm going to preach this message, or I'm going to serve in this helps ministry, or, or I'm going to do biblical counseling or whatever. But I, I, just, I just don't care who gets the credit. I'm just going to do it. And believe me, God will honor you in the end. I've experienced that in my life, myself in my own life. So this, this idea of the right focus, we're in a battle. And, and if, we, if we get that as a family and say, hey, we're, we're in this vision together. So, so whatever I can do, whatever I can contribute to the cause, m many times the the what's the word I want? The piddly, is that a word? Eh, maybe. Childness wears off, doesn't it? The little diddly things that I was complaining about or grumbling about or he said this or she said that or she didn't do this, it, it falls away because we got the right focus. Blood is thicker than water. Again, to use that old saying, and it's the blood of Jesus Christ that cleanses us from all sin, and that's what unifies us. So 
let me just encourage you in this as those who are redeemed in the family of God our obligation is to, to live above what the culture is telling us to do ah materialism you, you, that's yours you work for it you know enjoy it there's a balance there but when the, when the kingdom is beckoning for maybe your material goods or even your services ooh, don't, don't shut that down because you will shrivel and others, the family will suffer. Your gifts, know them, use them, whatever scale you're at. You know, everybody, everybody wants to be the preacher, right? The one up front until, <laughs> let me just say, we'll give you a week here if God's not called you to do this and strengthened you to do this. You come here a week and guess what? You say, well, I think I'll sing in the choir. Uh, I feel, or, or you hear this one, I think, and I don't say this irrespectively to God's leading, but, but I feel led to do this now. I don't feel led to do that anymore. You, you're going to hear that when people want to jump ship on stuff. So use your gifts, the importance of fellowship, just encouragement, coming alongside of people. Uh, and when you, when you come alongside of them, and I have to work at this. I'm not too good at this, but I, I am, I'm learning to listen to people, to, to just, uh, I, and I have to tell myself this, Keith, just shut up, just shut up. I talk to myself and listen. Because Paul tells us, we urge you, brethren, admonish the unruly, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with all men. That's, that's part of our kingdom duty. And then this idea of giving Particularly in the area of physical resources, if you, whatever stage you're at, when you get that in your, I learned that early uh, as a product of some of the people that I rub shoulders with at Word of Life. So, yeah, some of the, some of these people knew knew how to give, and and God God bless them, and we got, we want to train our children that way too. That it's not about not about just hoarding a bunch of things. We're teaching you to invest in the kingdom. And then harmony in the family. Let me just encourage you, if you're not in the practice of 1 John 1, 9, if you're not in the practice of looking in the mirror. And you know, when relationships go sour, and they do, whether it's in the marriage or in the, in the, in the church, in ministry, in friendships, Go to the mirror first before before you, you just make some rash decisions or some bad feelings start to grab a hold of you. And most of the time, and it's amazing how the Spirit of God works, especially when I don't want to go to the mirror, which is a lot. And I just simply submit to the Spirit and say, Lord, I, I don't want to go to the mirror. I said, that's fine. You'll go there eventually. But I'm going to create that desire in you. One way or another and it happens. That's, that's walking by faith. Just saying look. I don't want to do this. I don't want to use my gift. I don't want to give. I want to hold on to it. And walking by faith says. Yes Lord but I know I need to do it. So I'm, I'm just asking you to fill me with your spirit. To create that desire to just do. And he does it. That's what the filling of the spirit is. And then finally this outward focus of evangelism we're, we're working together in this <laughs> um, yeah how, how critical that is amen